Okay, I guess we'll get started now. Um, welcome everyone, this is uh, Stately State Machines with Rachel. Um, thanks for coming to my talk. I guess there's a couple to choose from, so I appreciate that. Um, I'm a little jet lagged, so if I seem like I don't know what I'm talking about, that's probably why. Um, who here has heard of Rachel before or worked with it, just so I, I know who's gonna know online? Okay, damn it. Okay, um, all right, we'll just get started. So uh, the goals of this, the goals for this talk are to convince you that Rachel's worth trying if you haven't used it before, and to give you some intuition about how it works, and to show you how to set it up uh, so that you can kind of do some basic parsing with it. Um, just a little bit about me. My name is Ian Duggan. Um, I'm into kind of lots of different things. I play hockey several times a week. Uh, this is Stormy the Pig, where I come from, North Carolina. Pigs mean hockey. Um, I play guitar. I play banjo, mandolin, ukulele. I have a fiddle that's gathering dust, and my cats actually appreciate that. Um, sometimes I fly. I've got a Cessna 120 that I fly out of Hayward, California. It's got a whopping 85 horsepower, but it's fun to put around the bay in the valley with that. Um, and I love my cats. A couple, you know, got to have cat pictures in a presentation, so here they are. This is Purrington, we call him Goofus. This is Minnie. She's a goofball. She likes to wear outfits. She doesn't care. She thinks they're fun. Um, this cat likes being cozy. These ones are dopey. Chill. Many likes to sit in strange places. So I'm a software guy. I code things. Um, I code the internets and the Googles. Um, I'm a recovering technology entrepreneur. Been uh, in and out of startup institutions for many years now. Um, my current status is that I work for Twitch. Uh, we do uh, online streaming social video games. Um, obviously, we're hiring. We have lots of Ruby. The whole front end is Ruby on Rails. Um, the back end is getting redeveloped into Go uh, for a lot of our services because we just we need a performance. Um, I've been using Ruby for quite some time now. I started on the 1.6 days. A friend of mine gave me a 1.6 book, and I was kind of playing around with it. I thought it was a pretty cool language. So I don't know when the transition happened, but I've just kind of stuck with it since. Um, but enough about me. This talk is about Ragel. Um, Ragel is this really cool tool, and it's it's used in a lot of sort of a high performance text parsing uh, areas and. You know, some people seem to have discovered it and are using it for stuff like that, and there's a lot of other use cases where people are kind of fighting with regular expressions where I think Rachel could be really helpful. Um, it's got a lot of features that allow you to do some kind of really cool tricks with it. Um, and if you don't have it in your bat belt, I'm hoping that you'll add it today. Um, as I mentioned, there are many projects that use Rachel. Um, Mongrel, Unicorn, and Puma are the, kind of the ones that people know about the most. Zed Shaw, I think, kind of popularized it you know, about 10 years ago when he um, rewrote the Mongrel HTTP, HTTP protocol parsing API with it. Um, there's a really cool gem called White Quark, which actually parses Ruby using Rachel. Um, the male gem, Red Cloth, Hpercot, Gherkin, they all kind of make use of it. Um, so just really quickly, what does Rachel look like before we jump into it? Um, it's this DSL, you can kind of define some actions, and then you've got some, uh, you've got some uh, ways of uh, converting different terms into other terms. So that's kind of what it looks like, and we'll get into the details here shortly. Um, so most, most people are familiar with regular expressions. And regular expressions are easy for the most part. Um, people understand them. It's kind of the basic stuff that we all understand. You know, matching, grouping, alternation, you know, matching zero, one or more, you know, n times, n times, etc. Um, and Ruby has really great tools for regular expressions because it has a heritage from Perl, set, and lock, which relied heavily on this. Um, so you could do fancy things like match stuff and in a block, match some more stuff and in a block, replace something that's three regular expressions down. So you can get pretty fancy with them. Um, but at some point, they can become irregular expressions. So if you've ever opened up a file and stared at something like this, then Rachel might be something worth considering for you. Um, they have their place, but there are better tools. Um, sometimes you want more control, uh, and I posit that this means you want some sort of automaton. So just a little bit about uh, automatons. Um, like finite automata have, uh, they're basically these uh, devices, they have states and transitions. Um, many people have probably seen these, like you got circles and arrows and some input comes in that causes you to transition to another state. Um, there are two kind of basic types. There's a deterministic finite automata and non-deterministic finite automata. It's just kind of an academic uh, distinction. Deterministic means it can just be in one state at a time Non-deterministic means you can be simultaneously in two different states. However, you could map those multiple states as superstates into single states and confirm that, convert that into a, 
uh, deterministic finite automata. So in academia, they talk about this equivalence of regular expressions, NFAs, and DFAs. So all this stuff that you're doing with crazy regular expressions, you can kind of do with these other tools. So you should choose the tool that kind of makes the job easiest for you at that point in time. <coughs> Excuse me. So, yeah, as a superset, these are all state machines. Um, state machines are an important tool in computer programming. Rachel is a wonderful tool for creating them. And state machines are everywhere. And they're in your stoplight. You have green, the timer goes to yellow, goes to red, goes to green, goes to yellow, goes to red, goes to green, around and around forever. Uh, they run your CPU. If you imagine your computer, like every single bit that's in it, um, as kind of a definition of a state, then every piece of input causes it to transition to another state. Your computer is one gigantic state machine. Um, there's some kind of non-state machine-ish stuff that happens on the edge when inputs come in asynchronously and stuff, but for the most part, you can think of it like that. It's a big work in state machine. And there's other examples everywhere. So like watches, vending machines, I've mentioned traffic lights already, barcode scanners, pretty much any piece of machinery these days that isn't analog has any kind of computing device in it, it's going to be a state machine of some sort. So I think they're the cat's meow. I think they're great for many reasons. They're simple to understand, and there's a great deal of research around finite automata and state machines. With the right approach, they can also produce code that is faster, easier to maintain, and correct, more correct, and thus more secure. Um, they're very specific about what inputs are accepted and what aren't, and it's, 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 it's harder to get it to parse something correctly than it is for it to admit something that doesn't parse which can be very useful. Um, if you're still not convinced, we should probably just spend some time uh, looking at what they are. So let's go over some vocabulary. So with state machines, they all have something called a start state. It's usually designated S0. This is, as it sounds, like the first state that the state machine starts in. They also have, kind of on the other side, an accept state or a final state. Um, they can have multiples of these, just depending on what they are. Um, and this, when the machine transitioned to this state, it's a, it is said to have accepted the string. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So within a state machine, to go from like state one to state two, in this case, when an H is received, you would go from state one to state two. It's called a transition. It's usually an arrow in the diagram. It's labeled with an arrow. Sorry, it's, a, it's an arrow and it's lit. Um, there's a special kind of transition called an epsilon transition. This allows you to go from one state to another without taking any input, so this can be useful to wire like the out. You can take two state machines, stick them together, and basically it works like a concat concatenation, like you don't need input to go from one to the next. So with what we know so far, we've got a couple of simple state machines that we can build. So like, if you think about a regular expression and how it's parsing things, this is kind of what it looks like. So A star will take any number of A's and just kind of keep mapping on it, as long as the first one is an A. The second machine just maps a single A, and then you're done. This next one needs an A, and then as many A's as you want after that point. So that's A plus. And from that, we can get more, more complicated. So this is a machine that will match zero or more hellos. So I, the start state is actually a final state, so that's acceptable. But once we've taken an H, we need an E, L, L, O before we can get back to a final state again. So whenever this is in a final state, it's accepting the input. So you may be asking, what's the big deal? I mean, these just look like regular expressions. I've done this before. I don't really need this. So what is Rachel exactly? Um, Rachel is a finite state machine compiler with output support for C, C++, C Sharp, Objective-C, D, Java, OCaml, Go, and Ruby. So if you're doing stuff across projects, it's really useful. Um, it also supports the generation of uh, several different ways of working its way around the, uh, around the states. Um, <clears throat> And it's really useful for building lexical analyzers and uh, protocol definitions, et cetera. So I talked about state machine generation. So another unique feature of it is that with these states and with these transitions, you can attach arbitrary code uh, at any point in time. So as you're moving around the state machine, you can pull things in and out of the, data, uh, the input and jump around in the state machine. And this is. These are the features of Rachel that make it like really different than just a regular expression. The regular expression, you can match a string or you can't. With Rachel, you can match half the string, jump to the end of the string, do some stuff, jump to the beginning of the string, give it some more data, you know, download something, upload it to YouTube, and come back. Like you can do that all inside Rachel if you want to. I'm not sure I would recommend that. Though. So I'm, I'm actually wasn't sure how to pronounce it. I've been saying Rachel forever. Uh, some people say Rachel, there's Rajul, there's you know, a bunch of different ways to 
So you can get the answer from the horse's mouth because Adrian Thurston, who created it, actually, I guess, sent an email some time. And he said that it's actually Rajol, which is not at all how I guessed. Um, <laughs> and it's, he said it was based on his uh, regular it's an R and L for regular language, and his nickname was Aj, even though it was Adrian or maybe it's Age. I don't know. So maybe it's Rajol, maybe it's Rajol. If he's Age, it would be Rajol, but he wrote Rajol, so I still don't know though. But if you know, please let me know. So darn, I've been pronouncing it wrong for quite some time. So on a more basic level, Rachel is a DSL for creating these state machines. It's especially useful, as I mentioned, for parsing protocols, data formats. Um, it's incredibly powerful. It allows you to do this in sort of a, a EBNF kind of format. So you get this really declarative approach to parsing text as opposed to kind of while loops and for loops and function calls and returns. So let's just take a look at the DSL and get a better idea of it. So the general structure of a Rachel file is um, It'll be written in the host language, so if you're in Ruby, it'll be mostly Ruby, and I'll have some sections in there which kind of call out pieces that are Rachel. So this is, this is a machine which matches FUBAR. Um, you can name several machines and refer to them inside your file. Um, there are definitions and instantiations, so this, this, this defines a piece of state machine that you can use, and you can compose it into a bigger state machine. Um, and to actually generate states, you need to have an instantiation of some sort. This is done with colon equals. And like any kind of programming system, you can include and import and do things like that. There's, um, there's some slight semantic differences in terms of what those mean, so you can refer to the manual for more details. Um, white space is ignored. Commas are started with a pound, just like in Ruby. Uh, there's different kinds of literals. There are string literals, regular expression literals, grouping literals. You've got kind of standard escape characters that we're familiar with. And if you need to jump, if you're inside a radial section, you need to jump out to the host language, you kind of put it inside braces like this. Um, numbers can be specified as either integers or hexadecimal, which is useful because when you're parsing in radial, you're actually looking at the, the uh, binary value. So if you're looking at an A, it's actually a capital A, it's actually 65, so you need to be aware of that. You know, it's got a couple of keywords. So these are these kind of first section here. This is this is the stuff that is more like a regular expression. So this this matches the word simple. So nothing too fancy there. We can have unit unit expressions um, similar to regular expressions. We have zero length matches. We have numerical literals, as I mentioned before. Like this is matching 42. So this would be the ASCII character represented by the number 42. And you can have regular expressions inside Rachel, which is could be a little bit mind-bending, but regular expressions actually compile down into state machines, so this is actually pretty obvious when you think about it. We have range expressions, so if we want to match A to Z, same as regular expression A to Z. This is where we kind of start to jump out of what you can do in a regular expression. Um, here you can kind of name something called secret code and refer to it in a different place inside a regular expression. So you can name it once and reuse it in five or six different places. And there are a bunch of sort of built-in character classes, any ASCII, extend, you know, printable, control, graph. So if you, for basic stuff, you can just reach to one of these. You don't have to define it all up front. So at this point, we sort of have the basic building blocks for building more complicated machines. So these are like levers, wedges, wheels, pulleys. These are like the simple machines that mankind has built. And on top of that, we've built rocket ships and gone to the moon. So that's what we're going to do next. So here's another cat picture. So when I was first learning about Rachel, I kind of I heard it was useful. I wasn't quite sure why. Um, I was reading through the, the user manual. That's like if you really want to understand how it works, that's the best way to do it. Um, there's a really good PDF online about that. But it has this really interesting thing where you can take a really complex machine and add it to another machine or subtract it or do an intersection or a difference or a union. Um, and it will do the math to kind of add and subtract the state so that it does what you expect. Um, this is kind of mind-blowing when you see it in process. Um, compositional operators are the things I just mentioned, union, intersection, difference, strong difference, concatenation, clean star, and we'll, we'll go, we'll check into detail in a second here. So a union, you would take, you know, this, this string up top could be matching, you know, this could have a thousand states in it, and one on the bottom could have a thousand states in it. The state machine will traverse both machines at the same time and enter a final state, but it does this by adding like adding together all the states and lining up the final results. Sorry, the final states inside it. Yeah, I got a bug 
my slide here some of the examples of showing it. But we have an intersection. So that would be matches any string that would be in both machines. So this is an example of that. It's taken the machine on the left here and the machine on the right, and it has merged them together into kind of one mega machine. So we can do a difference. So this would take any string the first machine matches minus any string the second machine matches. This is, this, is the regular, this is the state machine that you get from that expression. So as you can see, it's pretty complicated. And coming up with that yourself would be a mess, and trying to do that in code would probably be a mess, but it's actually pretty simple here in the DSL. You have a notion of a strong difference. This will match any string in the first machine, uh, sorry, any string of the first machine that does not have any string of the second machine as a substring. So one example would be I want to match any character except you know control character turn line feed. And character turn line feed is a is a compound string itself. You have concatenation, and this is just taking the epsilon states out of one machine, uh, setting up epsilon states which come out of the final states of the first machine into the second machine it creates like a global machine. Concatenation example. And you have other things like related to regular expressions like the phase down. No, this is feeding back. More basic repetition. We've got the optional operator. Optional example. So this would this would emit any string that the machine doesn't match. Application example. Sorry, give me a second. Special form of negation, uh, character level negation. Um, if you just need to get negate on a single character, there's a special operator for that, and that's this. Um, when, when you go through the work of putting these machines together and feeding them into Ragel, um, it does a kind of final process called state machine minimization, where it does some optimizations of the states within the state machine, and uh, it, it, any of them that are, uh, are redundant, it can kind of subtract out. So you may have a thousand, you may initially have a thousand states that you've kind of added together that could subtract it down to like 250 that are equivalent. So I mentioned before, like one of the powerful things you can do with Ragel is attach user actions to different parts inside the state machine. So this is a, some examples of how you would do that. You can define an action statement inside the DSL and then attach them to the transitions. So there are different kinds of transitions. There are entering transitions, so I'm going into a state. You can attach there. You can attach to a finishing transition, which is coming out of a state. You can attach to every single transition, or you can attach to just the leaving transition. And you would, you would do this, you would, you would choose based on kind of what you're doing, which one of these you want to do. And the embedding operators can get really fancy. There's like two or three pages in, in the manual about how to do this. So if you need more details, I just suggest you check there. Um, one of the problems you can come up with is this uh, notion of non-determinism. So you may have two, two machines that are stuck together, and you can't, you can't get out of the first state to match on the beginning of the sec uh, second. Uh, you can't get out of the first machine to match on the beginning of the second machine because they're matching the same characters. So an example would be this machine here. Um, so the, the, new line in the, the new line in white space will prevent the final new line from matching. So the solution is to exclude it from the beginning. <coughs> um, there's also ambiguity problems. Like if you're trying to match, if you're trying to match like a C comet, for example, you might say, okay, match slash star, give me anything, and then give me slash star. But you'll, you'll never match the slash star because you're matching on any. Um, and you can do things like, okay, match on anything except slash star and kind of add things together like this, but that gets ugly. Um, Rachel fortunately gives us some um, tools that are easier to reason about, so you don't have to kind of do this ugly stuff. The way it does this is it allows you to set priorities on the states. So you could say that I want the I want the transitions that go into the second machine to have pr higher priority. So one of the one of the techniques it gives you is a special notation called guarded operations, and these are called guarding concatenations. So an example of the one we just looked at: How do I match, say, on a C comment? Um, when you use this kind of colon greater greater, this causes the slash star in this final machine to match more strongly. So I'm going to match on any as long as it's not a star slash, and then it'll kind of come out of the machine. 
So we've got, and there's a couple different forms of that, whether like kind of the right machine is stronger or the left machine is stronger, or if you want like a longest match, but you don't want to kind of stay inside it. So one of the things that you, um, so that's kind of for simple matching, but a lot of times we're trying to build a scanner. Like we want to, we want to scan a file and we just want to recognize tokens in it, like one after another, after another, after another, have it keep going. Um, so Rachel has a notion of a scanner and this will keep matching on the input and it will take the longest match that it can and recognize that time after time. So an example of that right here would be like, so if you cut out, like, this is uh, like parsing headers. So right here we're saying a header, like within a header, I can match on a word, a space, or a new line, and this is what I'm gonna do for each of those. So it's gonna keep matching on a word. If there's a space, it's gonna ignore it. If there's a new line, it's gonna, uh, F return, which is actually kind of coming back to where it's called F call. So as I mentioned, it's uh, really useful for protocol parsing. This is what ZSHA did, and that's what Puma uses it for. So if you want like a good detailed example of how to like, parse HTTP using Rachel, um, Puma, I think, is the best resource. And up to this point, we've kind of been thinking sort of on the, um, on the level of regular expressions, but uh, on the lower level, these are just states with transitions, and Rachel actually lets you kind of go down into what it calls the assembly language of state machines, which is just saying, I want these states, I want these transitions, I want these characters to go from one to the next. So you can also define those. So this is an example of parsing XML C data body. Um, so this actually defines three states, start, one, and two, and some transitions based on what it's matching to go from one state to the next. And you can use F call and F return to kind of set up function calls within Rachel, which is useful as well. Um, when you start parsing stuff with Rachel, you're gonna, you're probably gonna reach for it, like instead of, instead of running a scanner or a lexer, you're gonna say, oh, maybe I can use Rachel. Um, one of the problems with it is parsing recursive structures. Um, regular expressions are not good for that, and Rachel's equivalent to a regular expression, more or less. So how can you do that? Um, the, the trick is to take advantage of these actions that you can embed, and when you recognize within your parse that you are looking at a sort of a nested construct, you can, in your host language, set up like a stack, and, and uh, you know, push a context to that and then jump out and jump back and look at your stack when you need to. So because you've got these embedded actions, you can like step outside of what regular expressions allow. allow. Um, you can also implement look ahead. So the trick here is to, you would uh, match on a couple of characters farther than you want, and then you can call f hold, which will kind of back the parser up. So each time you call it, backs it up one character. So Internally, when you're working with Rachel, uh, it, it has all these uh, it has these variables that you kind of interact with, and they represent the state. So there's uh, data, which is a buffer, which is where you kind of stored your string. So we'll see in a second here. Like when you when you call Rachel, you basically set up data in a buffer. You set a variable called p, which points to the front of the data, pe, which points to the end, um, and then you just tell Rachel to go, and it'll match on everything between p and pe. When more data comes in, you kind of tack it onto the end, move p and pe, and like tell it to go again. So if you want to match one character at a time, you can just line up P and PE and just kind of move them along. And when you're inside a scanner, uh, it actually uses some other variables, TS and TE, because it's, in order to do the scanning and do a longest match, it actually looks ahead and stores some state on a stack and backtracks when it needs to. So roughly, you know, you start in state zero, you feed it data, um, it runs the exact loop, the characters move through the state, you consume this P2P data, um, and it's done, if, you're, if your current state matches a final state which gives you a list of, that means that you've admitted a string. Um, for scanners it's similar except it uses TSTE in the stack. Um, the way you extract a string, uh, when you're, this, so this is like as you're moving through the scanner, like you'll use this kind of slash mark that marks the beginning of something you're interested in, and this percent would say like I'm leaving the transition, that's when I want to admit. So when I enter, I store where I was, so data P, and then when I leave, I store data P. I store it from my mark to my PE, I pull that out and I store it into my, my things array, for example. Um, as I mentioned, there's a bunch of different host language, languages and coding styles. Um, one of the nice things you can do with Rachel is you can write a generic parser and just refer to all these actions by name, and then you can have multiple other files that you would include. So I could have one definition of HTTP, and then my actions, I can have my actions defined in C and my actions defined in Java. And that's actually what Puma does. Um, you can also prototype something in Ruby, get it working how you want, and then go and convert it to C pretty easily because you have most of your logic inside Rachel. So the, the, the directives that you need to put in your file are in init, which sets up kind of all the state. Um, 
data, which has all the states and transitions. And uh, exec is actually causes it to run that loop that I was describing. So this is an example of some of the code that it generates. So installing it uh, on a Mac, it's really simple. Just brew install Rachel. And to generate the Ruby from a, from a, like a Rachel file, you just say Rachel-R for Ruby. Uh, Simple.rl would be the Rachel file in this example, and you give it the output. So this will, this will build your Ruby file. And we'll take a look at it in a second. And debugging these things, it's, it's, it's kind of hard to do visually, or it can be hard to do visually. So Rachel actually lets you um, Emit these out to a to a to a graphis dot file, which you can then kind of a, make an SVG or a PNG out of, and kind of like look at all the states. So I'll show you those in a second. So this is an example of calling it from Ruby. So this this would parse the data. So we take the data. Um, we have to unpack it into the binary format that I mentioned from characters. Uh, we set the EO, uh, EOF as a variable that Rachel uses to know when it gets to the end. Tokens is our variable where we're storing things. Uh, call init, call exec, and that's going to process everything that you put inside data. So somewhere in the actions, it's actually pulling things out and storing them, and the tokens are right here. So I created a tool here for uh, kind of doing some visualization of this. I'm gonna pull that up here to figure out how to get onto the other screen. Can you see that? And I actually can't see it, so I'm gonna turn around here. <laughs> That's dumb. I'll just mirror the displays, right? Where is my cursor? Where did it go? I've lost a window here. So this is actually a little app that I built uh, in Volt, um, which is a pretty cool framework. If you guys haven't used Volt, uh, you go to check. But it allows me to um, kind of experiment here and kind of see what the, uh, these graphs are. So normally to build these, I would have to run a couple of um, command line commands. But I just kind of set it up in here so I can, so I can do stuff like this. So I've got examples of like the different machines in here. So this is a machine that matches on simple. Oops, sorry, I have an auto update. So this is an example of the state machines that are being created by this. So if I were to match on sim or PLE, it would look like that. Or if I wanted more, zero more of those. Let's say I wanted one more of those. So I can kind of build these things up and play with it. But um, I have the uh, code for this like referenced here. Presentation will never. This is irritating. So if I want to kind of create a new machine here, so I'll just call this new machine. Let's take a look at some examples here. Everybody see that? All right. So this is an example of uh, the machine I, well, it's, li it's like the machine I showed earlier, where it was matching on, well, this is the machine I showed earlier. It's matching on zero more hellos. Um, so I've, I've set up sort of a regional parser base here. I don't know, actually, if you take a look at that. So in parser base, I have, I, I'm setting up some variables manually here. I have a way of feeding it data. I have a way of asking if I'm in a final state. 
of a way of pulling out the current match. And I just sort of, I have it outputting some debugging data here, which I'll show you on the console in a second. Um, but I just have this set up so that it'll read from standard in, so I can use it for experimentation. So this is a hello, this is hello parser, and this is, this is the file, this is what the file you work with looks like, and then if we take a look at like the generated file. Oops, sorry, the hello dot rb. So this is the generated file, and Rachel is doing all this work for you. So this is setting up all the states up top here. Um, this is a pretty simple state machine, so there's not much going on here. But um, this is the init that we saw. This is the perform method, and this is the exec that was buried inside of it. So it's setting up all the states. It's doing go-tos and jumps and matches and et cetera. So all this really nasty code, which is heavily optimized, so that's why it's so fast. So this particular example here, So I typed H. You can kind of see that it's in current state one now. P is at one and PE is at one. And we have one piece of data at H. If I say E, L, L. Our final state here at the bottom is still false, because we're not in a final state. If I press O, we've now entered a final state. So we've matched on hello. If I press H again, and we're not matching. E, L, L, O. If I press any other character, I'm going to step outside of what it knows, so I'm now in an error state, and I'll never match again. So that's an example, of sort of a really basic example. Um, I have some arc parsers defined here. So there's, I mentioned state charts and not using state charts, so I have one defined here using uh, the sort of standard approach. So this is the main part of my parser, and I'm just saying I want to match on an arg dash and flags, or dash dash long opt. Long opt I have decided, uh, defined as a bunch of alphas. Flags would be a bunch of alphas as well. And what this is going to do is this parser is going to go around and around in a loop, and when it sees a dash dash long opt, it's going to call saw long opt. Um, so the Ruby code is actually pretty simple there. And these are the actions up here. So I call mark arg when any took out a mark this out of it. Oh, really? You can't see that? How do I change the color? Yeah, that's a good idea. How do I do that? What's that? Uh, okay. Where's my system preferences? Accessibility. Display. Work colors. There you go. Is that more legible? Yeah. Okay. So what uh, what I'm doing here in the code is is 
when an alpha is matched for the first time, I'm kind of marking the beginning of the uh, marking the beginning of the argument, marking the beginning of the flags, marking the log ops, and then when I get to saw arg, which is what the scanner calls, I'll use that previously marked thing to kind of pull out what was there. Well, that's freaky. So I can do dash ASDF and see it. And I put in flags ASDF, so that means I matched that map there. So now I could do like a long one. I could say long opt. So I matched on long opt. So that's just an example of kind of doing basic argument parsing there. And then I have an example of this in the sort of state chart for it as well. So state chart is a little bit more complicated. Um, when you draw it out of paper, it's simple, and then you can actually you can do the dot viz visualization of this as well. But I start in a start state here. If I see a dash, I'll go to pre flag. If I see a quote, I'll jump to quoted value. And if I see anything else, I'm going to kind of start a, a value arg. So as an example, this is what I'm calling a value arg. Is just kind of a word uh, quoted v would be a quoted word. Flags would be this, and like a long, long flag would be that. So the basic idea here is that you create some buffers, and as you match or kind of go around in a circle in a state, I'll keep appending to that buffer, and then when I leave the state, I'll emit what I want, looking up what I've stored. And oops, sorry, the Ruby code for this again is very simple. Most of the work is being done up inside the parser. So as an example, the same thing, but you know, I can say you know, ASDF and then valarg, and I got a valarg. I can say quote, quote V, and I got a quoted value. Space brings me back to start. I can say dash dash long equals, I got a long, quote, quoted, and I got a quoted. So I have, um, I have links to all this code. So after the presentation, you guys want to like pull it up and kind of like dig through here, figure out what's going on, um, what's in there. Let me go back to the presentation here, if I can find it in this color. Why not an in invert? Where is my presentation? Presentation got closed. So while I'm looking for this, uh, does anyone have any questions? Um, I'm not familiar with what, so treetop's all in Ruby, right? Yeah, so treetop is, it, it may be similar, like, like pres presumably they might be doing kind of similar techniques under the covers. Um, I'm not super familiar with how treetop does things, um, but this is like super highly optimized. Like for the C version, it can actually, it, it actually one of the versions compiles it down into just jumps within a while loop. So like it'll 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 go to the bottom, it'll go to, it'll go to, it'll go to, it'll go to, and it's it's almost like optimized assembly. So I'd be surprised if it wasn't faster, but it probably really depends on the use case. Mm. No, definitely. Um, it, it allows you to it allows you to do chunking, so you can kind of think about your problem in smaller pieces and unit test those, and then compose them together. So, like as I mentioned, the the, the composition is like it's two main things that make it really cool. The composition is one of them. Like that's kind of mind blowing. And then the fact that you've got these actions. So, I can not be in a programming language and then suddenly be in a programming language. Okay. 
Right, right. Yeah, I mean, if you're, if, does Treetop do other languages as well? Okay, yeah, so if you, if you were writing an HTTP parser and you wanted it to work like, you know, quickly on JRuby, so you wanted it down in Java, and also like in CRuby, so you wanted it down in C, then this would be a good choice. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so the question is like, how, you know, this is using instance variables and kind of local variables, and so how would you like turn this into kind of like a, com a composable unit? Yeah, so that's, that's actually kind of what I, what I tried to demonstrate here. Um, so I created this Rachel parser base, and I have, I have several parsers which kind of inherit from it. The default is to use local variables, which obviously is kind of painful. Um, part of the DSL, and you probably can't see it again, so let me, let me invert this. Yeah, so this is, since I, it, it depends on where you put these, um, it depends on where you put like these things. So right, I, I put these inside this object that I've created. So when it, when it refers to at, it's gonna be in the context of this object, inside the context of this method. And you can remap what it does. So normally it'll just refer to P, and I have it referring to at P, because I set up the stuff over here. Oh, hey, there it is. So I showed the demos, and that was it. So I've got these resources here. Um, I have the slides up, and I've got the uh, I got the playground code up there. I had some other features I wanted to add to it, but I kind of ran out of time. So I hope that was useful. Sorry if I droned on.